All right, uh, tonight's study, Lord willing, uh, we'll take a look at two sticks, one kingdom. And the reason I think this study is uh, interesting to me at least is that this is something that I've been, uh, hey Sean, welcome. This is something that I've been uh, considering. Let me go ahead and put the, uh, hey. Yeah, we got started a, a little bit uh, late tonight. Uh, Thomas was out and uh, was just waiting for uh, some other visitors. But uh, we're just starting to look at the uh, this study here, two sticks, and what it means really. You know, I, I, I began to think about the nature of the 144,000, and one of the reasons why I, I wanted to look at this study is because uh, I think there's some verses in the book of Ezekiel 37 that these verses are offered in support of the the 144,000 that we read about in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14 where uh, it appears as if God there is talking about two different sets of 144,000 now of course by God's grace you know we, we continue to look at this just to see whether or not uh, the Bible might support or confirm this. But what I uh, proposed in the past is that, no, this is the same 144,000. It is the great multitude. But these verses here that we're looking at in Ezekiel 37, I think were also used to try and, and show that when God is talking about joining two sticks together, uh, His plan was that one stick really being representative of the New Testament church age and then the other stick right the other group or category of people who become saved after God begins to bring judgment on Babylon so in Ezekiel 37 verse 16 and, and you know again uh, I was beginning to suspect that the two sticks there and God bringing the two sticks together into one stick that, that that was the language or a picture of salvation. But let's go ahead and take a look at that. In verse 16, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph. And then in verse 17, And join them one to another into one stick and they shall become one in thine hand but what's interesting here and I didn't even realize is that in the same verse or the same verses in Ezekiel 37 God it seems begins to elaborate he begins to elaborate on what he means by bringing the two sticks together in verse 18 when the children of thy people shall speak um, yeah, wheat and tares in a way, Sean. Um, but hold on a sec. Let, let me see if I can try to share these verses here, Lord willing. Uh, that might shed some light. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we see here in verse 18, when the children of thy people. Yeah, you know, the sticks uh, is uh, another word that is used. Uh, that's also translated tree. And I think it does identify with people, right? Just like the bones, it identifies with those that are in the church body itself, the churches and congregations. So we see here something interesting in verse 18. When the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not shew us what thou meanest by these? So God here, he is going to explain in the same chapter. Let me see if I can get this to post. He is go oops. Now I have to break it up. He is going to explain in the same chapter what it means, I believe, when he brings two sticks together. Now take a look at verse 
21. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. Isn't that interesting? Verse 22. And I will make them one nation. I will make them one nation. And the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. So automatically we see that the, the sticks are really talking about the people, the, the, the churches themselves, right? The congregations. God now is going to bring two nations, and now he makes them one. But you notice the language here, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms. Now let me ask you something. At what point in time was the kingdom of God divided? At what point in time was the kingdom of God divided? Now we know that Christ has always been in the midst, right? Uh, even during the, uh, the New Testament church age. But this language here that neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms. What about Mark chapter 3 verse 24? Uh, prophet writes, the ten tribes broke off. Well, yeah, that, that's an interesting statement because I think I, I do get into that a little bit uh, later on. When the nation of Israel, remember when God took the kingdom away from Solomon? Remember that? Yeah, yeah. So when, when God took the kingdom away from Solomon... And he divided the nations. And then you had the ten tribes and the north and the two tribes, right? Judah and Benjamin and the south. Why is it? Why did God take the kingdom away from Solomon? Remember we talked about Solomon to some extent. And it seems that God was using him extensively as a picture of, of whom? The fact that he fell away, he, uh, he began to... He began to embrace other gods. He, yeah, exactly. He worshipped false god. Now, why would this be important? Why would this be important if we try to relate that to what's going on when the church body came into in the tribulation? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's the way I believe it is, uh, Thomas. Yeah, he was playing the harlot. Exactly. Now, can you begin to see perhaps a, uh, a parallel between Solomon and the church body? Can you begin to see that? That he was typifying the church body going away from God, right? So basically, he was. Uh, we're looking at the falling away. So the kingdom became divided. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what I'm going to propose here, but I'll see if I can get these verses, uh, you know, to try to relate to that. So we read here in Mark chapter 3, verse 24, If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So the kingdom of God, when God allowed the uh, Satan, when he allowed the uh, wickedness to develop in the body, Civil war be <laughs> yeah exactly well that's the picture I think we are getting now you notice here in Daniel chapter two verse forty one whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay part of iron the kingdom shall be divided now today the kingdom is divided right the kingdom is divided and it was also divided I propose coming into the great tribulation. Here's another couple of verses. Daniel chapter 11, verse 4. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of, of heaven, and not by his posterity nor according to his 
dominion. So again, I'm beginning to suspect here that when God is talking about a nation being divided, he has in view the church body coming into the great tribulation. Does that make sense? And that's, again, I believe that God used Solomon to point to or to typify what was going to take place when God allowed Satan to come, right, in the form of the false prophets to come against the church body. And then he begins to, yes, exactly. As a matter of fact, I think I have that verse. Uh, if you bear with me one second here. I think I have it somewhere. I'm not sure. If a house be divided against itself. Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions. Now, these are some verses that we've looked at a number of times, but until we begin to relate them to the rest of the Bible, I think by God's grace, uh, we might begin to see a, a wider picture, right? Because the, uh, the call here is that the body be perfectly joined together. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of, of partition. Now, I think we're going to see also that this is true. You know, the, the, uh, the divided kingdom. What happens, you and I, or anyone else for that matter, what happens before they become saved? Before someone becomes saved, isn't it true that they are separated from God? Yeah, they are separated from God. There is a middle wall of partition between them and God. There is war spiritually. And now God, when they do become saved, now it's as if there is peace, right? There is peace now, and Christ is the Prince of Peace. Now there is peace between God and, and that individual. Well, you know what? I think God, again, God is giving us the same picture. And I've offered this a number of times. When the whole church body comes into the great tribulation, God now is looking at the whole body as unclean. doesn't mean that the believers are not saved. It's just that corporately, as a body, God forsakes them in tribulation. The third part is brought through the fire. And then God speaks of the salvation, right? Just like, you know, the individual becoming saved, the body also. Now, now God begins to speak of a salvation that I believe has to do with, with the depart out, right? It's like coming out of Egypt. Okay, so we see this here, that God is bringing them into into one, right? He joins the two together. Now in verse 23, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things. I will save them out of all their dwelling places. Now again, uh, the reason I think this is important, right, right, exactly. And you know, I think some people have a hard time relating to this. I know I did. I did because it's kind of hard to say, well, how is it that God was looking at the believers as being a part of Babylon? Remember the study we did when we looked at the deadly wound? God is talking about the beast. And then we saw that by God's grace, a number of verses appear to be telling us that the beast actually becoming healed is really pointing to the redemption of of the body. So I think this is very important, Lord willing, that we uh, be able to distinguish between yeah between uh, the individual salvation and the salvation where God now is actually cleansing. He is bringing the elect body out of Babylon. He is delivering them. He is redeeming the body. Now this redemption, again, as I propose, it's not really looking at another group or another category of people that are now becoming saved, but rather the same body of Christ 
that was saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The same category of people who were told to be patient in tribulation because God was hiding his face from the body. Now God begins to take action. Now he avenges the blood of the martyrs. Now he, the Bible is unsealed. Now he brings revelation to this to this group, to this category. And that's what I believe is in view. Where God speaks now, he is going to make them one nation, right? They're no longer going to be separated, but rather now they become one. When? Well, when God begins to bring back the captivity of his people. But notice again the language very carefully. Neither shall they defile themselves. Oh, wait a minute. Were the believers actually defiled? I think they were. Corporately, God is looking at the whole body when he hides his face from them. He refines them. He brings them through the fire. And now there is a purity. The very fact that God now is bringing them out of Babylon, he is cleansing them so that now they can actually, now they see Christ face to face. Isn't that interesting? Same thing here, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. <laughs> yeah, can't be in it without... Right, exactly. And as a matter of fact, you know, what I've proposed in the past is that how many of us, and I think Sean, uh, you know, Sean and I discussed this in the past, how many of us can actually say that we did not teach incorrectly in the past? How many doctrines have we held that were not altogether faithful to the Word of God. How many times we talk about hell and damnation? <laughs> yeah. How many times, you know, we, we've had, uh, and, and of course, God, it seems, He allowed that to happen during the New Testament church age. Uh, but the very fact, I mean, if, if, if we were not being faithful, yeah, like accepting Jesus, uh, I think some of us, perhaps to some degree, and others, uh, maybe not, but certainly I think we can identify with a number of doctrines uh, today that God is unsealing the Bible, that we would have to say, well, these were not altogether faithful to the Word of God, correct? And if they were not faithful to the Word of God, you know, the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So God, it seems, he was not idle. Now, he understands that the, the elect, the believers, they're a part of the body. Nothing can separate them from the love of God. And that's why God begins to bring back their captivity. But insofar as coming into the great tribulation, the kingdom was divided. God hides his face. The two sticks, they were separate, right? There was a division in the body. And now when God brings the two sticks together, it is the redemption of of the body god now is bringing back so that now they no longer defile themselves with their idols i will save them notice the language here the language of salvation i will save them out of all their dwelling places and will cleanse them so that they so shall they be my people and i will be their god and uh, in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, I was saying here that uh, the day of the Lord, the great tribulation and the depart out, it is a time of Jacob's trouble. But notice God saves Jacob. He saves the body. He redeems the body from this tribulation. He shall be saved out of it. Okay, verse 24. Going back to Ezekiel 37. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. Who is David typifying here? Who is David a picture of? Well, we know that it's Christ, right? Yeah, it is Christ. Uh, Thomas writes, not sure how the two sticks today come together again. I am thinking about the separation of the wheat and tares. How do the two sticks come together? Well, the, 
the wheat and the tares, they were growing together, right? And then coming into the great tribulation, God forsakes the body. The whole body is subject to the wrath of God. And then God brings back the captivity. He redeems the body. He purifies the body. Now it's as if the body is coming back to Christ. And I'll see if I can uh, you know, show that with some other verses uh, having to do with the bones in a few minutes. Yeah, but very good question. Zechariah. Right, exactly. Now it's only the wheat. The wheat now is what makes up the kingdom of God. And God unseals the Bible so that the believers begin to, uh, they make correction. They understand more and more the whole nature of God's uh, judgment and salvation plan. Yeah, and the burn, the, the tares, now there is a great gulf phase. The tares are cast into the lake of fire. They are gathered for the burning and God no longer is uh, has any dealings with them. All that is left is wheat. Yes, yes. And now the wheat, it's as if the wheat now is come back to Christ. Right? Corporately, the wheat is being joined. You know, the bones are coming together. Uh, wheat equals two sticks brought together. Yes, yes. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, the, the separation really, I believe, is what was causing uh, the fact that God was looking at the body coming into the Great Tribulation. He was looking at it as, as two separate entities, right, as far as how he relates to the body. Okay. I'm trying to go, uh, you know, not go too fast, right, and I understand that uh, we, we have to try to... Uh, you know, and, and digest, uh, Lord willing, this information. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I'm proposing uh, so far, is that the, the, the idea of bringing the two sticks together, it is the language of salvation. Now we're going to look at the, uh, the gathering of the sticks, and then right after that, I'll share some verses having to do with the bones. And I think this also, Lord willing. Matter of fact, you know what? Let me do this. Let me get into the bones first, and then we'll come back to the gathering of the sticks. The reason for this is because I think uh, we'll see the same picture here with the uh, with these verses in Ezekiel 37. Now, you notice here in verse 1, Ezekiel 37, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, he set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of, of bones and caused me to pass round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. Now in verse 3, the question is raised, Son of man, can these bones live? Now who are the bones that God is looking at here? And why are the bones dry? Hold on. Yeah, what do we think of when something is dry? You know, the Bible says, uh, Amos chapter 8, The days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Right, so if it's dry, the bones are dry. Yeah, there is, you know, there is no salvation. There is no rain. Exactly. There is no water. And we know God speaks of a famine of hearing coming to the church body. When God allows Satan, he allows the, the wicked in the body to rule and dominate. And now there is, a, there is a famine of hearing. The church body is coming into the great tribulation I believe that's the time when God is looking at you know those that are going uh, their own way they fall away so now he sees the bones right those in the corporate body the bones are dry and then he says can these bones live and I answered O Lord God thou knowest again he said unto me prophesy upon these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord 
Now again, uh, I think we can look at this individually as others become saved. But all these verses, because the Bible, uh, you know, Lord willing, I believe is always current events. God is giving us the same picture again when we consider the nature of the body coming into into tribulation. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise and a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. Now isn't that interesting? Whose bones are in view here. You know, I thought about this for some time. Bone to his bone. Yes, yes, exactly, prophet. That's what I, I began to suspect when God says the bone come together, bone to his bone. So that has to be, Lord willing, the bones of Christ. Well, how is it that the bones are coming back to the bones of Christ? Well, again, because the kingdom was divided. It was two sticks. The kingdom was divided. When God brings the kingdom back to the bones of Christ, now it is one kingdom. It is one nation. It is New Jerusalem. Why? Because God has redeemed the body. Ephesians 5 verse 30. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother. What does it mean spiritually to leave father and mother? Any idea? <clears throat> what does it mean spiritually to leave father and mother and to be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh? Doesn't, you, doesn't the Bible use uh, the, uh, you know, when we look at the church body as a whole, God, it seems, he looks at it as a family, right? He refers to it as uh, brother, sister, mother, father. So I propose here that when God is speaking of leaving father and mother, it has to do with leaving the church body, leaving the corporate church. And now... The believers, they come to be with one wife. So they forsake the family. Yeah, exactly right. But today, we're looking at the mother, which is Jerusalem above, right? She is the mother of us all. But also, the old Jerusalem, it seems, God was also using that as a picture of, of the family. So now, I propose that the believers, the elect, they leave father and mother. They separate themselves from the body. Yes, definitely, uh, prophet. I'm glad you brought that up because I do think that I, I have some verses on that. Matter of fact, I was just getting ready to share that. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. This is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and the church. So we see the spiritual connection. Micah chapter 3 verse 3. Who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and they break their bones. Now you know when the locusts, the false prophets, the pastors, the unsaved in the body, when they begin to rule and dominate, they kill the two witnesses. It's as if God is giving the uh, the body over the two witnesses over to to the locust and God I'm sorry Christ when he went to the cross he came under the wrath of God but then we read some very interesting language here as prophet pointed out John chapter 19 verse 36 remember when Christ was hanging on the cross and they went and they broke the bones of the two thieves did they break his bone did they break the bones of Christ? I don't think so. Yeah. And I think that's very significant. 
because we read here these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled a bone of him shall not be broken a bone of him shall not be broken well that's interesting right why is it that a bone of the bone of Christ would not be broken well if we look at the big picture or the bigger picture I should say does Christ also relate to the believers to those in the churches and congregations does he relate to them aren't the believers a part of the body of Christ so that today his bones that is the members of his bones these are not broken see that oops hold on one second these are not broken when the two witnesses are killed and the bones are broken the believers God brings them out of tribulation God redeems them so that now they, the bones come together bone to his bone bone to the bone of Christ so the idea of the bones not being broken I propose it is God redeeming the body the believers do not come under the wrath of God right exactly the bones were scattered but now they are gathered they come back to the fold they come back to the Lord and that again I propose is the redemption of of the body isn't that interesting now can you see how the bones when God brings the bone to the uh, back uh, to the bones of Christ how this uh, seemed to tie in very very directly and very nicely Lord willing <clears throat> to the uh, the two sticks God says that now they will be one nation they're no longer divided okay now let's go back to the gathering of the sticks the gathering of the sticks <clears throat> you know uh, yes exactly Thomas thank you thank you by God's grace I, I think uh, you know you, you might be seeing the same picture the sheep are scattered the bones are scattered right it is two sticks and now they come to be one nation now they come back to the bone of Christ isn't that interesting and it all has to do I believe with the believers being brought back from from captivity numbers chapter 15 verse 32 we read a very interesting account yeah yeah I think that's a fair statement I think but you know uh, corporately though God is looking at the whole body as being the body of Christ I am the vine, ye are the branches, but the branches that do not uh, bear fruit, they are cut off. Remember that? They are cut off. So yeah, I guess in a sense, you know, the unsaved, because they, they're called but they're not chosen, they were never meant to be part of, of New Jerusalem. Is that fair to say? All right, now, Numbers chapter 15, verse 32. While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath. Well, what is so important about gathering sticks on the Sabbath? What's important about gathering sticks on the Sabbath? Well, you know, it seems that gathering sticks, yeah, no work on the Sabbath. But the work there, a uh, prophet, I believe it is uh, spiritual. It has to do with those that are... Uh, trying to provide for their salvation and it also it could be related to sharing the gospel but we know that Christ is the rest yeah Christ is the rest and so the command in the Old Testament was that they were not to to do any work they would have looked to Christ right so the seven day Sabbath Lord willing was pointing to it was pointing to Christ the Lord of the Sabbath changes that law. His work is now, yes, yes, because Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. But you notice the the problem there, God was very angry. Um, now let's take a look at There's another aspect. I'm not going to get too far into it uh, tonight. 
There is another aspect of the Sabbath as it relates to the Great Tribulation. We read here in 2 Chronicles 36 verse 20, Then that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill, verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So, can you see perhaps, even when we're talking about the Great Tribulation, God appears to be linking the Sabbath to the Great Tribulation. When God brought judgment on the church body, they're not keeping the Sabbath, they're not trusting in Christ. They began to rely on their own works, their own salvation. So this would identify again with the falling away. And because of that, the land lies desolate, right? The two witnesses are killed. So that there in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, I believe, was a picture of the Great Tribulation. Okay, so this man is found gathering sticks. He is trying to keep the law, it appears. He is trying to provide for his own salvation. He is sharing the gospel. He is not resting in Christ. And because of that, God brings judgment to him. Prophet writes, so not keeping the Sabbath is like salvation through works. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm seeing by God's grace. But take a look at this account. There's another account of gathering sticks we find in 1 Kings chapter 17. This has to do with Elijah. We read here in verse 10, So he, Elijah, arose and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering sticks. Gathering of sticks. Yeah, exactly, Thomas. It has, to do, it has to be the work of Christ. But you notice here that God finds favor with this widow woman because she is gathering sticks. And we know from the context, God appears to bless uh, this, uh, this activity here. So that, I believe, would have to be a different way of looking at this from the account of Numbers chapter 15. So she was gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Verse 12. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel, a little oil, a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks. Interesting language again. I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat and die. Now again, I'm not going to get into this too much. The idea of dying here, that has to be a focus on salvation. Right? The death of the righteous. Believers are buried with Christ in baptism. So she eats. That's a picture of receiving uh, Christ, the bread of life. And she finds the grave. She finds salvation. Uh, prophet writes, is gathering, uh, joining into one. Well, in this account here, that she is gathering two sticks. Yeah, exactly. That, that seems to be, uh, you know, precisely what uh, this is talking about. Thank you for pointing that out. That she's gathering two sticks. Uh, I guess the nature of gathering the sticks, the two sticks, perhaps to bring them into one. And that, again, would be the language of salvation, having to do with re uh, redeeming the body. I all seems there to be Christ-directed. The woman gets water as Christ told her. Yeah, right, because there, this woman, I believe, is operating under the, uh, the command, whereas the man in Numbers chapter uh, 15, it seems that he did not have the blessing of God to gather sticks on the Sabbath. Can you see the difference? Yeah. And we can tell in this language here in verse 16, well actually verse 15, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. Salvation, right? 
that appears to be the language of salvation she finds favor with the Lord she gathered the sticks and now she identifies with Christ verse 16 and the barrel of meal wasted not neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah you see so it's all under the command of God okay very interesting again I propose that the sticks have to do with uh, how one tries to provide for salvation and we know that because of this you know the the church body coming into the great tribulation God forsakes them now it's as if they are gathering sticks on the Sabbath they're trying to provide for salvation they're trying to relate to Christ but in reality unless God himself is gathering the sticks unless he is bringing the kingdom together they end up like the man gathering the sticks in Numbers 15 you see that A very interesting connection there it may not be easy to see on the surface but Lord willing if we try to relate that to the uh, to the nature of God bringing back the captivity of his people I think we uh, we do begin to see that it has everything to do with the redemption of the body okay now let's take a look at a couple of more verses uh, having to do with salvation and I think these also Lord willing will tie in to the nature of God bringing back the captivity of his people he brings the sticks together John chapter 10 verse 16 and other sheep I have which are not of this fold them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd now again this is a verse that is often used to say well uh, this other group here the other sheep that's uh, that's another group that's going to become safe after God brings judgment to Babylon and I propose again that that Lord willing would not be consistent with the rest of the Bible because what is the purpose of judgment the purpose of judgment is you know to, to bring a famine of hearing it is to cut off the body altogether and God says in Revelation 7 before uh, he allowed the herd to come on Babylon he had to make sure that he sealed because when the man of sin when the Antichrist is ruling that's a terrible form of judgment as God allows the, the unsaved uh, to destroy the body uh, prophet writes who are the sheep not of the fold well I propose here that this uh, first of all you know when Christ was speaking these words the uh, the gospel still had to go out through to the whole world God had to uh, bring a, a number of believers to salvation God had to seal them before bringing judgment on Babylon so these would also identify and we read here in John chapter 10 verse 1 verily verily I say unto you he that entereth not by the door into the the fold the sheepfold well then this means that yeah it has to be all the elect right God was saving them during the New Testament church age they too they are being brought into the fold these are the other sheep right not the disciples that he was talking to there at the time not the prophets not the Old Testament prophets these had already become saved but the gospel had to go out into all the world God had to bring them also into into the fold uh, two folds there become one fold eventually Jews and Gentiles if saved made two folds becoming one yes yeah I believe that that's uh, that's the picture that we're seeing there Thomas all become spiritual Jews as one yes amen and then we see here in John chapter 10 verse 27 my sheep hear my voice my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me well who are they that are hearing the voice of Christ anytime someone becomes saved they hear the voice of God and they come into the sheepfold right and they come in through the door yeah they come through the door those that are coming those that are trying to jump the gate these would have to be identified with with the thieves the thief does not come through the door that uh, the door is Christ my sheep hear my voice I know them and they follow me well what about today 
we know there is a famine of hearing when the body comes into the great tribulation how does one come out of Babylon how does one come out of Babylon well they have to hear the voice of God isn't that interesting the Holy Spirit is poured out the second time Lazarus come forth so coming out of Babylon again I propose it is a command to rise the hour cometh when all that are in the graves and the graves identify with the church body with Babylon they have to hear the voice of God my sheep hear my voice and God now begins to bring back their captivity come out of her come out of Babylon Thomas writes some try to get in through the through the window Christ opens and shuts the door yes amen amen all right uh, a couple of more verses now can you see how this language here in Isaiah 65 verse 25 is really talking about the same thing isn't it the wolf and the lamb shall dwell together what happens between the wolf and the lamb well they happen to be enemies they happen to be enemies and the church under the operation under the uh, the leadership of the Antichrist when there is a falling away when the church body falls away it's as if now there is division right a kingdom divided against itself does not stand now there is a separation there are two sticks a kingdom is, uh, is, is is split and God has to bring that kingdom back together he brings the two sticks into one the wolf and the lamb shall feed together salvation now there is no more animosity in the kingdom right the believers are seeing Christ face to face uh, Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 19 almost done Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 19 and it shall come to pass when ye shall say wherefore doth the Lord our God all these things unto us then shall thou answer them like as ye have forsaken me and served strange gods in your land so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours can you see how this ties in to Solomon who began to go after other gods and God took the kingdom away from him as a form of punishment yeah so when the corporate body as a whole again the believers are a part of the body prior to the separation God looks at the whole body it's as if now the body has fallen away the, uh, there is backsliding they go after uh, strange gods and because of that God forsakes them yes before the separation I believe that's the case there prophet but notice the language very very carefully like as ye have forsaken me and served strange gods in your land so shall ye serve strangers so God allowed the church body to serve strangers and that's why you know I was saying earlier that the believers they had a number of doctrines that were not faithful to the Word of God and God allowed that to happen but today because Christ is revealed the book is unsealed God is bringing correction God is bringing the sticks together the bones are coming back to the bones of Christ there is no more animosity in the body the unsaved right the tares they are burned unto the burning now they have no place in the kingdom of God yeah amen so we do see how this uh, ties in Lord willing and finally in Joel chapter 3 verse 17 so shall ye know now this is when God brings back right notice uh, the, the similarity notice uh, the consistency Lord willing in the verses when God brings back the captivity of his people when he brings the two sticks together so shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion my holy mountain then shall Jerusalem be holy well, wait a minute weren't the people of God holy even before God brought judgment on them 
But you see how God here is looking at the whole city, just as he did with the nation of Israel. That's why all of them had to go into captivity in Babylon. Remember that? Because of the wickedness of the nations, the people there. He allowed the, the king Nebuchadnezzar to come in and destroy the city. And he took them to Babylon. So that was a picture, again, Lord willing, of the believers coming into the Great Tribulation. Yeah, now it is New Jerusalem. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers. You see that? Today, there is a separation. God is not allowing for the the strangers to be a part of the body. Why? Because he has taken on the responsibility of feeding his people with knowledge. The book has been unsealed. Christ, the word of God, is revealed. And now the whole kingdom, not just the believers that, that exist today, God, I believe, has in view the whole kingdom. Why? Because God or Christ is the head of the body. And he is never separated from the body. South Piso, welcome. That makes sense? So then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Salvation. Okay, let me go ahead and conclude, and then we'll open for a conversation. So what I propose here... The Bible appears to be equating the joining of two sticks with salvation. Coming into tribulation, the body was separated from God because of sin. The same would be true individually, right? Prior to salvation. And then what happens? It became two kingdoms, the same way God splits in the days of Solomon. He split the kingdom. The ten tribes went to the north and the two tribes to the south. With the church in tribulation, the kingdom was divided and given over to Satan. Now God would be saving the body. God is redeeming. He is saving the body making it into one nation, one stick, as he brings back its captivity. Okay, um, bear with me one second. <clears throat> 